You know, there's nothing like getting freed up from debt. I don't know if you've ever experienced that, paying off a credit card or getting out of debt, paying off a loan. But let, let's say you put $1,000 on a credit card. If you only pay the minimum 2% payment, it will take you 14 years to pay it off, and you will have paid an extra $1,122 just in interest. So that $1,000 thing or things that you bought end up costing you over $2,000. Wow, it is great when you can be freed up from that and not have that on you anymore. When you're, if you have uh, multiple credit cards or even just one and your credit cards are maxed, it affects your credit score, which makes other things in your life cost more too. It's very interesting how that works. But when you pay off debt, you're free. You're free from obligation. You're free from that obligation. You're free from worry. Uh, a lot of times you're free from financial arguments with your spouse. Sin creates a debt to be paid. It's a very interesting thing. You might not have thought of sin as a debt. But it's just like when a criminal owes a fine. You know, when uh, the, the, the sentencing has happened and you committed a crime, and the judge says, you have to pay a fine. Your sin, your infraction of the law, created a debt that now you owe. And it, it, it is that, that debt, in this case, it's a, it's a punishment. Well, the Bible says that the fine for sin is death. That is very serious. And I talked about last week how sin leads to death. Sinful choices lead to death, death of relationships, uh, death of hope, death of dreams. Sin leads to death. But in God's kingdom, the punishment, the wages, the fine for sin is death. So I've got some good news for you. Would you turn in your Bible, if you have a Bible, to Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. And if you don't have a Bible, I encourage you to get the app. It's called U version, Y O U version, and uh, it, uh, you could even get it now if you don't don't already have it. And then you've just got the Bible with you in your pocket all the time. And if you if you've got a Bible or you're dialing up on your app or whatever, then just look up Colossians, Colossians, C O L O, Colossians, and, and uh, sometimes just go into the, the table of contents. That's good enough. Just go find it. So we are in a series of messages on, on, on these Sundays called Renew. You have been raised to new life with Christ. And we just saw that in baptism earlier today in this service, people being buried with Christ, raised to new life. And so Renew talks about living the renewed life that Jesus has for you. Our vision is to see every one of you, including myself, find real hope, and renewed life in Jesus, renewed, constantly renewed, continually renewed life in Jesus. And it is a lifelong process. I talked about that a couple weeks ago. It's a lifelong process of becoming fully alive in Jesus, that is living the renewed life. So today I want to talk to you about getting freed up, getting freed up. Somebody say freed up. Getting freed up. And just like I talked earlier about getting freed up from a debt, like from a monetary debt, you can get freed up from sin and from other things. In the New Testament, the, the, the Bible uses two kind of word pictures for this getting freed up. One is putting to death. So we are commanded over and over in the New Testament, put to death certain things. Put to death evil attitudes and actions. Put those things to death in your life. So there's this amazing thing where when you give your life to Jesus and you're baptized and you're, you all, your old self is buried with Christ and you're raised in new life, there is this thing where, where Jesus puts some stuff in you to death. When you give your life to Jesus, he, he takes your old sinful nature and gives you a renewed nature. But there is a, another component where you and I are supposed to put to death 
evil actions and attitudes in our lives. So put to death, that's one kind of word picture for getting freed up. The other one is strip off, like stripping off, like a, like a worker who has a super filthy, dirty coat. Maybe it's got paint all over it or tar, depending on the kind of work, or concrete or whatever you got on that coat. And at the end of a long day, you just strip that off and all that dirt just comes off. That's another word picture of getting freed up in Jesus. So you, you strip off, you get rid of ungodly or unholy ways. So we're going to take a look about at that today and, and really look at that, that, that half of it, that half of the equation, putting to death and stripping off. And then next week, if the Lord allows, I have planned to kind of look at the other side of it, which is what to put on in your life. So it's kind of a two-part message today. Today is strip off or, or put to death, and next week is, is be renewed in life and put on and put on love and, and all those things that God calls us to put on. Okay, so Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 3, and we read in the NLT, uh, there, uh, the Bible was not written in English, it was written in Hebrew and Greek, and so we got to read an English translation. There are different English translations, but if you've got an, a device you can look for NLT, New Living Translation. That's what we're reading in. Here we go. Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, somebody say, I've been raised. raised. Yep, I've been raised to new life in Christ. Set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. And I talked about this last week, that uh, what is it like in heaven? What are the realities of heaven? Well, the reality is everyone's worshiping Jesus. Everyone's following him. There is life. There is health. There's no sickness, no pain, no death. That's the realities of heaven. So Paul, uh, the early church leader, Paul, wrote this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. There's a challenge for even what you and I think about. Why? For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. So because your real life, the source of your real life is God, and that's where your real life is hidden, think about that. Think about him. Think about heaven. And let that propel you forward as you follow Jesus. So since Jesus is Lord over all, he, we know that because he sits in the place of honor, and if you have put your faith in Jesus, and if you've been baptized into Jesus' death and resurrection, then let your life show it. Let your life show it by living daily in the death, resurrection life of Jesus. Old life being put to death, all, your old ways, which is getting rid of them, and there's something happens. God, when you put your faith in Jesus, you're converted, you, the Holy Spirit comes inside you and makes you new, and we're human, and we're not in heaven yet, and so many times we are still kind of clinging to old ways of living. So, that, so even though Jesus has made us new, the Holy Spirit has regenerated us, made us born again, still we have some choices to make every day because you can go back. We're in our, in our uh, small groups on, on Sunday nights, on Wednesday nights, in our, in our um, Hope and Life groups, we're, we're looking at the life of Jesus as portrayed in the, series, the TV series, The Chosen. And we see, spoiler alert, uh, hopefully not, uh, in a recent episode, we see one of his disciples turn back, and she made the choice to no longer follow him for a couple days. But the, the community of faith went after and said, no, no, we, we want, come, come follow Jesus with us. We're all broken. So my point is, we still have a choice to make how you walk. You still got to follow Jesus and put to death those things in your life. And so that, that don't belong there anymore. Going on, Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. So put to death the sinful, earthly things. I love this word lurking within you. Don't see lurking every day. I love that. So put to, put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. So earthly as contrasted with heavenly. Set your sights on heaven. And I don't know how much you think about heaven and Jesus during the week, but I just want to challenge you. Set your sights on heaven. Be thinking about that. Let that motivate you in your life. So today we're going to look at those things that we need to put to death. Okay, so put to death the simple earthly things lurking within you. And he goes on and he describes two 
main categories of sins, okay? So we're going to kind of develop those today as we're going through it. Um, the the uh, first one is sins of desire, and the second is sins of disunity. Those are two kind of broad categories. There's probably a, a bunch of different ways we could have categorized this, but I, I like this. Sins of desire and sins of disunity. In another part of the Bible, in James, a letter written by James, an early follower of Jesus, chapter 1, verses 14 to 15, he describes this process of how our sin drives us toward death. James 1.14 says, temptation comes from our own desires. There's that word desires, which entice us and drag us away. And these desires give birth to sinful actions. So there's something that starts inside us, in our heart, in your mind, there's a desire that crops up. And when it's a sinful desire, that, that desire gives birth to sinful actions, behaviors. You act on that, but it almost always starts with a thought. And when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. Remember, we've said sin leads to death. That is just, it's a, it's, a, it's a universal principle that has been in place ever since humanity sinned and turned away from God. So there's this process where it starts with a thought, there's simple actions, and that becomes a lifestyle, and then that leads to death. But when you obey the command that we read from Colossians 3, 5, when you obey that command to put to death those old ways or you strip off your old sinful ways like stripping off a dirty coat, you interrupt that process that James was describing. You interrupt it. You get in there and interrupt it by the power of the Holy Spirit working in your life. It's a very, the sin, the sin cycle it's a very difficult thing to interrupt. So how can God require us to? Why would he even require this of you? If, if it's so hard to kind of get in there, man, a, a, a sinful thought comes, and to, to just stop it there and put that thought to death and get rid of it and think, uh, think a, a replacement thought from God's word or sights on heaven, that's so hard. Then why would God say you got to do it then? Well, Stay with me. Let's, let's talk about this. We are looking at the, at, this, at the Bible. There's a very definite command here. The first one is this. Put to death sins of desire in your life. Put to death sins. Not, not, not all desires are sinful, but the sinful ones. Put those ones to death in your life. Okay, and we're going to start listing out what some of those are. Colossians 3, 5. So put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. So when Paul uses that little string of words, uh, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, he was basically describing the typical Roman man of his day. That's how they lived. They lived an indulgent life, a promiscuous life often taking advantage of other people, people that were below them in their station. So a, a, a homeowner may take advantage of slaves, and all of that was sinful. And, and Paul is saying, that's not how we live as Christians. That is not what the renewed life look, looks like. The, the typical Roman man the, in Paul's day in first century, uh, that, that typical Roman man lived a life of dominance, of status, of indulgence, if it feels good, do it. But God's view of sexuality is different than that. It is a view shaped by holiness, by love, agape love, not lustful love, but the, the love that sacrifices to give to others, and faithfulness. That, that's what God's kind of love looks like in this area in our, in our lives. It's a love shaped by holiness, true sacrificial love, and faithfulness. So I, I want you to know this, because I, I, know, I know who I'm talking to today. Where it's, two, it's 2023, for heaven's sakes. I want you to know, God is not a prude. God is not uh, Queen Victoria of the Victorian age. You know what I mean? 
we must cover our limbs. That's not God. <laughs> that is not how he is. And how do I know that? Because God, when he created humanity, gave us the gift of sex. It was his idea. So it's just, it is erroneous, deceived thinking to think that God wants to keep that gift from us. That is not his plan at all. It's a gift that he gives to us. And he gave us that gift to create oneness in marriage. We know that, that the two become one. That's God's plan. We know that God gives marriage to create children. So it's a very creative thing that God gave us. And we know that it is an illustration of how much Jesus is connected to the church. Our marriages are actually an illustration of that, of, his, of Jesus' relationship to the church. But God does require you and me to put to death sexual immorality. So you know what the root word of this word translated sexual immorality is? The root word is porn, which means prostitution. So many of us, we don't really connect all those things together, but that is how God uses it, sex outside of his plan. But this word came to mean, be a little bit more generalized, it just means sexual immorality in general, as forbidden in the law of God. In Leviticus 18, in the Old Testament, we see the law of God, and God is very specific about what's okay and what's not. He's very specific about the boundaries, but remember, God gave the gift. So if I'm going to give my son a car when he turns 16, there are going to be some boundaries. You know what I'm saying? We're going to obey that speed limit. Yes, we are. There will be no drinking and driving. That is correct. There are going to be some boundaries. But I gave him this valuable gift. I don't want him to mess himself up or hurt himself or others with it. And that is God's view when he gave us the gift of sexuality. Now, in Leviticus 18, God said this. Don't act like everyone else in the world around you when it comes to your sexuality. Or if you obey my commands, God said, if you stay within the boundaries I gave you, this is the phrase, you will find life through them. You will find life through the boundaries I set even on human sexuality. That is where life, renewed life, beautiful life, eternal life. That, that, is, that is the context for that. And that's the whole point of God's boundary. His boundary is not to withhold something beautiful that he created for you. His boundary is not to be stingy. His boundary is not to be a prude or a sissy or a Victorian queen. That is not how God is. His, his boundary is for life. His boundary is to protect you, his children. His boundary is to, for you to flourish in your relationships. And in that chapter, chapter uh, Leviticus 18, I, I don't know if I can even say all these words, but God goes on. He, he forbids incest, adultery, same-sex relations, bestiality. He is a very, very clear and specific, like th this is the boundary. You, you don't go outside that. Now, in the new, if you're going to live a holy life following God, in, in the New Testament, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 18, Paul takes, takes it even one step further, and he says, run. Somebody say, run. Other translations say, flee from sexual sin, which is sex outside of marriage. And that is a very hard to do today because there is a whole tsunami of pressure to cave. There, there's pressure of what you see online. There's pressure with what all your friends are doing. There's pressure from every movie, every show that has anything to do with relationships. In, those, in, the, in the movies, in sitcoms, it is sex first, relationship second, and that is not God's plan. Now, I will say this. I am not condemning them. I wouldn't expect them to act any other way if they're not following Jesus. Why would we expect the, you know, everyone around who's not following Jesus, why would we expect them to act like someone who's following Jesus? But for us who are following Jesus, we do have a different set of boundaries. Those boundaries are not to hem you in and trip you up. Those boundaries are to give you life and help you soar and enjoy God's gift in the context that he created it for. 
Okay, so that's just one part of putting to death sins of desire. There's another aspect of it that he's, he specifically talks about here. Colossians 3, 5, the last half of the verse. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. So God, wow, he gets right in there, and he's telling us to put to death sins of desire, where where we have sinful desires that are not God-honoring, we are to put those to death. And trust me, it is a process. It is hard to put to death those things. Don't be greedy. Now, there's a, there's a lot of sins that uh, we who are following Jesus, we, we kind of say, here's, here's, our, here's our, like our priority list or our seriousness list. If it's a sin in my life, it's not that serious. If there's a sin in your life, it's very serious. That's kind of how we categorize it. That's not how God categorizes it, okay? That's not, how his, that's not his lens at all. So this is a sin we almost never talk about greed. God sees greed as the same level as bowing down and kissing an idol, a statue, and saying, I worship this idol. God sees greed that way, which is why every single Sunday we say we live generously because we don't want that. We only want to worship the living God. We don't want to worship idols. And money, for some reason, it just has the ability to get a hold of your life, and it can be all-consuming, just that dollar. I just got to get that dollar. I got to get more of those dollars. And it's easy to let that take God's place in your heart. Money can take God's place in your heart, and that's what worshiping is giving someone something first place in your heart. We give God first place in your heart. So put to death sins of desire, sinful desires. We've got to put those to death. We've got to work on it. We've got to take steps towards God, towards the light. We've got to work on that. A second thing, put to death sins of disunity in your life. Put to death sins of disunity in your life. Colossians chapter 3, I'm going to skip down a little bit to verse 8 and 9. But now is the time. Somebody say, now is the time. Now is the time to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, talking bad about people, or typing bad about people. Yeah, dirty language. Don't lie to or against each other, for you have stripped off that dirty coat. You have stripped off your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds. These things destroy unity in the church, in the family of God. All those things I just read, anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, dirty language, lying, those destroy unity in the body of Christ. And the, these sins cause people to take sides, to be defensive. When someone comes at you all angry, all angry or they're saying bad stuff about you, it makes you defensive, and then there's this escalation that goes. These, these types of communication, they damage other people's self-esteem. How many of you can remember something someone said about you when you were young? Yeah. Most of us, our hands go up. A good thing stays with you. A bad thing stays with you. Our words are very, very powerful. And sinful words, these things that I just listed out in verses 8 and 9, they don't belong in your life or mine. Again, in James chapter 1, verses 19 to 21, he wrote, you must all be quick to listen. Everybody say, quick to listen. <laughs> oh, yeah. Boy, we sometimes kind of, we kind of reverse these. We've got to be quick to listen. And you cannot listen with your mouth open. Quick to listen, <laughs> slow to speak, and slow to get angry. That's the kind of life, renewed life, that God is calling you to. Verse 20, human anger does not produce the righteousness, the right living that God desires. So get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives and humbly accept the word God has planted in your hearts, for it has the power to save your souls. So put to death sins of disunity. So why... Did God warn us to put to death the simple earthly things lurking within you? Is, is he trying to make life hard? Is he trying to beat you down? Is he trying to be oppressive? No. In Colossians 3, uh, verses 6 to 7, be, here's, here are some reasons why God gave us these warnings and these rules, these, these um, 
these boundaries. First of all, verse 6, because of these sins, the anger or the wrath of God is coming. Here's the thing. God does not want you to experience his wrath. So he warns you and I ahead of time and says, don't live that way and you won't experience my wrath. So that's one reason right, just from this, from this chapter. God is warning us because God loves mercy more than judgment. That's what he wants is mercy in our lives. In verse 7, here's the second thing. Here's the second reason why God gave us these boundaries. You used to do these things when your life was still part of this world, but you've become a new person under a new Lord. You're in a new kingdom, so we got to act differently. In verse 10, put on your new nature. Be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. And here's a third reason. In this new life, it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave, or free. So in other words, he's saying your category doesn't matter. The labels you put on yourself, that's not what matters here in the kingdom of God. What your daddy said over you, that does not matter here in the kingdom of God. What the press says about you, that's not what matters. What your teacher labels you, that's not what matters in the kingdom of God. No matter what label, no matter what category you brought to following Jesus, that's not what matters. Here, here's what does. Christ is all that matters. And he lives in all of us. You, and if you've put your faith in Jesus, his spirit lives inside of you. He's all that matters now. It's not that, that you're a certain nationality or that you know, you're, you've had a certain experiences or a lack of education or too much education. That's not what matters. What matters is Christ Jesus living in you. And you have come into fellowship with a new family, the family of God. And it's our responsibility to protect the unity of the family of God. So if, if you put your faith in Jesus, it's just that simple. There you go. Just do it. Just put to death all the sins of desire and disunity in your life. Sinchy, right? No. None of us can do it. God's given us a command that you and I cannot do on our own. We can't. You can white knuckle, I'm going to try hard, all you want, but you cannot do it on your own. There is a tsunami of pressure against you. None of us can do it on our own, but Jesus did. Jesus lived a sinless life. He did not commit sins of desire. He did not commit sins of disunity. He lived a sinless life for you and me. So what we are to do, what you and I must do, and I'm preaching this to myself as well as to you today, what we must do is rest in the finished work of Jesus. That's what we rest. We rest in his ability to conquer. We rely on his ability to put to death and get rid of. We rely on Jesus, on the power of his Holy Spirit in us. And he wants to give you the ability to conquer more and more every day, to put to death more and more every day, to live more and more for him every day. And not only put to death, but to bring in life, to live in renewed life, eternal life. I'm going to talk more about that next week, of what that new life, and it's a beautiful picture. You're going to love it here in the kingdom of God. Let Jesus live his death slash resurrection life through you. Amen? Why don't you stand to your feet if you would, please? And I'd love to just pray for you. Uh, you don't have to close your eyes to pray, but it does sometimes help to, to just kind of shut out distractions. So I just think I invite you to close your eyes, get ready to pray. Online, same thing. Participate, lean in. Let's pray together, everybody. Let's pray. Lord, I acknowledge that I have sinful desires that impact others. We acknowledge that we have sinful desires, sinful thoughts that impact others and that often are part of a cycle in our lives, Lord, a cycle of desire, behavior, habit, death, desire, behavior, habit, death. And Lord, I just ask you to break that cycle in our lives, Lord God, today. That familiar sin, 
we break it off today. We don't want it to be familiar anymore. We don't want that to define our lives. We don't want to say, yeah, I always do this or I always think that. We want to be new. And so, Lord, I pray that we would walk in the newness you have provided for us by the power of the Holy Spirit, relying on the finished work of Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to live like that with renewed life, Lord. And with your head still bowed, I'm just wondering how, how many of you would just be honest enough to say, I uh, had some things come to mind today about that need to be put to death in my life. If that's you, would you raise your hand? And my hand's up there too. And you know what? Just to encourage you, most hands are up. You're not alone. You're human. That, that is the human condition right there. So I'm just going to pray for you, Lord. You see all of us who raised our hands. And we realize, Lord, that every thought is not pure. Every thought is, um, is not generous. <laughs> Lord God, we, we realize that sometimes we're angry or we rage or, or we slander somebody or we're, we act maliciously. Lord, we, we acknowledge that. Some of those things are in our lives. Lord, we just say today, Lord God, we don't want them to be there. And we need your help. We need your help, Lord God. So I pray that you would do your part, that you would just uh, put to death those things in our lives. And I pray, Lord, that we would do our part, that we would put to death those things in our lives, Lord God. And fill our lives with what is holy and pure and lovely and a good report, Lord. That's what we want in our lives. So right now, we're thinking of some specific things. And we don't have to say them out loud because we know you can hear. Because we've invited you in. You hear our thoughts, Lord. We're thinking of some specific things. And we are making the choice right now to put those things to death. Strip those things off our lives. We're making the choice right now. Today's going to be different. Tomorrow is going to be different. We start to stumble. You're going to be there. And by your power, those things are put to death in Jesus' name. By your power. Help us to live an empowered life full of real hope and renewed life. Help us, Lord. With your head still bowed, I'm wondering if there are some of you, you've not yet put your faith in Jesus. Or perhaps you did when you were younger and you realize, I'm not really following him. How do you put your faith in Jesus? You turn away from your sins. You turn your life over to Jesus. And you let him lead your life. And as you can see from this message today, your life's going to look different if you let him lead. It is. But it's going to be better. And you'll be heading towards heaven. So if you've never put your faith in Jesus, I invite you to do that today. If you have in the past, but you realize you've not really been following him, same, same invitation. If today you want to put your faith in Jesus, would you raise your hand? If, if you're in the room, that's going to be a signal to me. I'm going to pray for you. That's all. If you're online, I can't see you, but I'm going to pray for you, and God can see you. Anybody else that would say, today, I'm putting my faith in Jesus. I want to be regenerated, born again spiritually. Anybody else? Awesome. All right, I'd love to just coach you in a prayer. In, in the room, online, either one, you can pray this prayer, but don't pray it to me, pray it to Jesus. And let's just do repeat after me, just so I can coach you. you uh, it's not magic words, but it, I, I, can, I, can, you, I can lead you that way, all right? All right. Would you repeat after me? Everyone just join them, but if, you're, if, you're, if you raise your hand, you're, you're praying this to God right now. Here we go. Jesus, I invite you into my life. I acknowledge I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of my sin and make me new. I want to be renewed. I choose to follow you and be your apprentice starting now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And if you prayed that prayer, congratulations. That's amazing. Several people just put your faith in Jesus today. So here, here's the thing. You put your faith in Jesus, and you get baptized in water. I can stay after service, and we could do it right now. Or you could wait for the next baptism class, which will probably be uh, in, a, in a month or two. Either way, let's get her done.
All right, so if you put your faith in Jesus, we'll baptize you now. We've got some spare towels, and we can make it happen. <laughs> Second thing, you gotta, you got to start following Jesus. So would you tell us about that? Yep. Awesome. Wow, what a great Sunday, man. Exciting. So if you are newer to the faith, um, we have a resource for you. It's called the Following Jesus Course. It's a free book. It's a free course that we walk alongside you in. It's available in the lobby. There's a table. I'll be standing out by there. So if you are new to Jesus and you just, you want to know, like, what do I do? Like, how do I be a Christian? Because as Pastor Garen was saying, this is a process, right? You're not just like, boom, I'm perfect. Here I am. <laughs> Here I am. Born again. You know, you're born again in Christ, but it's a process. And so this, these, this book just talks about seven steps on how to follow Jesus, and one of them is baptism. So I encourage you, stop by the Following Jesus booth. Let, let us equip you with that, and let us help you as, you as we all follow Jesus together. Sound good? Great. And if you filled out those Connect cards, if you could just put them in the box in the, in the back on your way out. And if you are a parent and you dropped off your kid this morning, um, before you go pick up your kid, would you just um, talk to Pastor Tori in the back? She's got a pickup label for you. We were having a little bit of trouble with our printers this morning. So, but we, all, we got those ready for you. All right. God bless. We love you. Have a good day.